Let's do this. Okay, who are we? Oh, you need a drink right <laughs> I got the long drive home, so yeah, just one. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's get this thing started. Who here has actually heard of show dance? By show of hands. Oh, we got quite a few. Keep your hands up. Who's actually logged in to at least a free account? You come up if you have. Who's actually has a paid account and or has done something really cool with show dance? All right, that's a level I hope to do. Um, we've got some people that have used it, and uh, we've got other people that are interested. <coughs> so when many of us think of the internet, we think of the World Wide Web. But according to the data collected by John Matterly for show dance, that's only a small fraction of what actually makes up the internet. Of the half of the trillion devices that are out there, only about 10% of them are what make up the World Wide Web. So I drove up here from Kansas City, and I really want to thank you guys uh, for helping me get here. Uh, I felt like a convoy, like I was on a CB radio, but I was really just on Slack trying to figure out, like, how do I get to this location? Thank you very much. So to me, that's the mark of a great community, helping others. So give yourself a hand. My name is Aaron Blythe. Uh, I've been working in software for about uh, over 15 years. I started off as a developer, but I've always been that person that had like a bunch of the devices on my desk. Uh, years ago, I was the one that ran like an extra Citrix server, so we could you know, uh, actually test our code. Uh, when Jenkins came around, I was running Jenkins on my desk. When virtual machines uh, came out, I was like jumping on that. I was like, wait, you know, I don't have a bunch of stuff stacked on my desk. That's awesome. Then. Um, I kind of, from there, uh, I kind of switched over into the DevOps uh, area. I still write a lot of code, uh, but what the code I write is now for operations instead of just for what my business does. Uh, I've run the Kansas City DevOps Meetup, which is a monthly meetup for the past four years or longer, and we're going to have our second um, conference in September. So come see me. I've got cards for the conference. Uh, it's DevOps days in Kansas City. So I did uh, one semester of college in Australia. Um, a lot of facts about me that you didn't care to hear about. Uh, I didn't go to class that much, but what I did do was I surfed every day that I possibly could for months. I wasn't really very good. To be good, you need to surf for years. But every day when I got done was like paddling out for what amounted, um, what seemed like hours. For those few seconds of getting up and coming in, this is the smile I had. Water would pummel me, and I would just get beat. And this is what I think of um, whenever I'm working really hard in software or IT. You spend all this time trying to figure stuff out. And then eventually you have that moment of clarity, and things open up, uh, and that's that contented feeling at the end of the day. So Shodan was created by the self-described internet cartographer, John Matterly. He conceived of this idea back in 2003, which is amazing to me that that's 14 years ago. He launched it in 2009, and you can find him uh, on Twitter as Killing. The easiest way to get started with Shodan is just to go to Shodan.io. What Shodan does is to index all of the devices that are connected to the internet. Basically, what we're working with is like Google index for the devices on the internet. So who's familiar with NMAP? I'm sure. Yeah, it's that badass tool that Trinity used in her hacking session in the Matrix Reloaded. She actually um, used it correctly uh, to hack the power grid of the city to get a vulnerable SSH server, and then she used the SSH1 CRC32 exploit from 2001. She used that correctly too. You see that awesome scene where like the power grid just shuts down across the city, right? However, as cool as MMAP may be, I've warned against using it unless you know what you're doing. So directly from the nmap.org um, site, I've got a wall of text here for you, but I'm going to go ahead and read it and break all the little presentations. When used properly, nmap helps protect your network from invaders. But when used improperly, nmap can, in rare cases, get you sued, fired, expelled, jailed, or banned by your ISP. So reduce your risk by reading this legal guide before launching the internet. Damn! <laughs> when I first heard about Shodan, I have to admit that I was apprehensive to even use it or open it. Consider
considering what I've heard about internet, especially when casting such a wide net out there as to map the entire internet. But to be clear, Shoman is not in there. Just like with books, someone needs to organize all the library of all that information. So what Shodan does is it crawls the internet IPs continually and randomly from data centers that are spread out all across the world. So continually, so it's, it's pretty close update, it's near real time. Randomly, it's not like a map that it's all coming from one source, um, and the data centers are dispersed throughout the world because different countries have different rules on where traffic can go. So the basic unit is a banner that's returned from the service. The first banner I have here is the uh, Apache. So if you're familiar with HTTP, you make an HTTP request, this is the kind of information that comes back in those headers. So this is index. What I have here is an industrial control um, system. It's actually in the Siemens S7 ICS. It has a banner similar to what you're used to with HTTP, and uh, it has different information. This banner is then decorated with important information, such as the host name that it came from, the operating system, and the geolocation of that device. So what's indexed? Of course, web servers, but as we discussed uh, in the opening, that's only about 10% of the internet. There's also databases, as we would expect. Not all databases are exposed internally. Did I lose? Oh, oh no, no. Sorry. Um, some, some databases are actually exposed externally, so they're available on, um, on the internet. However, there's also been this explosion of what we call IoT, or Internet of Things. These are webcams, watches, and many other personal devices. So speaking of Internet of Things, have you heard about this one? You leave your dog in an internet-connected box outside of a business. What happens when the thing's unplugged? Well, the power goes out. Or it gets hacked. There's a drone on the market now that picks up dog pit poop throughout cities. No shit. And the other thing that's indexed are industrial control systems. This is one of the things that was the most interesting to me while I was researching this presentation. Uh, there are many pieces of uh, complicated industrial machinery out there. So before um, the internet uh, companies, oh, before the internet, companies had to pay like highly trained uh, technicians a bunch of money to drive out to where their systems were. So they're paying these people most of the time to be driving, probably 80, 90, 95% of the time. So what they did was they took their devices and they connected them to this awesome new thing called the internet. They did this actually before there was a lot of things like Linux and uh, some of the web service uh, ideas like we use today like REST. So they created their own proprietary way to get out to these industrial control devices. Um, so these are the things that run your water, your electricity, your gas, and many other um, important pieces of technology. So if we scroll down on the front page of Shodan, um, we can click on a link for a sample report on Heartbleed. So let's go ahead and do that now. Hopefully, we can get I'm on this side, this side, up, down, left. Does anybody see my... This always happens. Okay. So I'm going to have to do the thing where I switch back and forth between... Uh, mirroring my displays. I apologize for that. But we're going to make it work. All right, so here we have Shodan. All kinds of cool stuff here, but the first thing I want to show you is we're going to scroll down and we're going to look at this sample report on Heartbleed. I want, to, I want you to take note. Someone could write this down even. Uh, on this sample report that was taken um, in March of 2016, 
there was 237,000 plus uh, devices that were vulnerable to heart bleed. Uh, really cool stuff about this, like I said, it's tagged with metadata. So we can see the countries that are most likely to have uh, devices. We can see the type of thing. Luckily, uh, it's HTTPS, um, mostly, instead of just HTTP. The top organizations, and this one's inter interesting, the top organization uh, that has devices that are um, vulnerable is Amazon.com. Anybody have a guess on what those are? You think it's the company, Amazon.com? AWS, which we'll see a little bit more proof here in a minute. Um, the top negotiated uh, HTTP versions is 1.1, luckily. The, um, there's very few of the 1.0, so people are using the, the newer spec. Sorry, beer gives us feedback. Um, mostly it's Apache. Uh, I found this to be interesting that um, Apache's had 2.4 out for a long time, but um, as you know, like, you have to be on like really late versions of Red Hat Enterprise Linux for that even to work or whatever. So it's mostly Apache 2.2. Um, so top domains, AmazonAWS.com, SSL versions, uh, mostly TLS, version 1 and 1.2 and 1.1, pretty evenly split, and SSL version 3. Uh, mostly not expired certificates, but some expired. Do I just need to talk louder? I'm sorry, that. Weird. Let's try over here. You think that's it? Or was it because I because I crossed the wire? All right. Then. Okay, I'm gonna try to keep floating over here, but also um, doing my demo. Okay. Here's what we do. All right, uh, and mostly it's uh, it's mostly Linux three uh, X, which I thought was cool. All right, so. What we want to do is, this is an older um, one, we want to actually want to click on this report and drill down into this, and this is how Shodan results, results usually look. Anybody write down that number before? 237,000 back in March of 2016. As a community, we're making progress. Number's now um, 85,000. So good job, security community and DevOps, and yeah, yay for us. So here I can click on um, the United States, and that should rebuild my results. And I'm going to go ahead and click on New York. And then I'm going to go up here in these search results, and I'm going to change New York to Kansas City. And there are 59 in uh, Kansas City, which is where I'm from. Uh, also. Uh, where I uh, work with a lot of people that work in Overland Park. Can someone write down the 59 number? Because I'll never remember. Uh, we're going to switch this out to a city of Overland Park, which is in Kansas. There's 92. Oh, i got to switch this displays again. I do apologize for... Okay, so that was interesting, right? Um, this, is, this, this part here is directly from the book by John Matherly. Again, I'm giving you just a wall of text. And uh, again, I'm going to um, uh, do this wrong and just read it to you. Um, note that the tests for the crawlers only grab a small overflow to confirm the service affected, is affected by Heartbleed, but doesn't grab enough data to leak private keys. So when Heartbleed came out, I don't know how you guys all took care of it, but we wrote a bunch of scripts to check versions of uh, OpenSSL that were running. That's not what Shodan's doing for this report. It is actually, in a minuscule way, doing a bit of the exploit, but not enough to be invasive. Uh, I highly recommend this book by John Matherly. He's the one that created Shodan. Um, but yeah, totally different than the way that we went about it. This is actually telling you, so if your device is on this list, then it is 
uh, susceptible to heart bleed. It's not just a matter of, oh, I got, maybe I got the wrong version or whatever. What was that number for Kansas City? Someone wrote it down. 59? When I started doing this research, the number for Kansas City was 145. What was the number for Overland Park? 95? When I started doing this research, it was 195. I'd like to think that I helped this number go down um, since I alerted people that I know that work at these companies. No consulting fees. It was just the right thing to do. So I was doing this research and I saw, I was like, hey, I know um, a person that works at that company. I'm going to reach out to them and let them know that they have stuff that's out there. So that's rad. Um, the next feature is math. Uh, you only get this one in the paid version. Uh, so based on the time that I have today, um, I'm not going to um, dig real deep into maps because they do take a little bit of time to render. Um, but we can look at it afterwards if anybody wants to chat about it. Um, the query language looks similar to any query language uh, that you might be familiar with. Um, if you've used the advanced features of like Google search or if you've ever used Solar, which is um, an indexing and search type of thing, it's uh, very similar to that. Uh, or even Elasticsearch, which is very Solar-like, but they both have Lucene behind them. Uh, I'm not sure if this particular tool has Lucene. I'm guessing it does because that's what almost everything uses. So John Matherly seems fine with this being um, a little bit more technical. And actually, I'm, I'm fine with that too. Uh, I actually don't want this to be so accessible to everybody, but hopefully people that actually know what they're doing. Um, however, as I showed earlier with the UI, you pretty much just kind of point and click and it makes that search for you. So you don't have to learn this at the beginning. You learn it as you go. Uh, some people might be aware that Krebs on security was attacked last fall. Uh, this was a DDoS that was executed for many Internet of Things devices that had default, weak, or hard-coded passwords. Mostly they were DVRs in this particular case. Um, Krebs reports that the source code for this botnet was released. The problem is um, that there are likely just as many devices out there that are still connected to the Internet uh, with those weak passwords. So let's look at IoT devices. Now, I, if I could figure out how to get my mouse over there, we wouldn't have to do this whole dance here. <coughs> displays, mirror displays. So this is one of the ways that you can search. Uh, notice I didn't use a search box here. In the URL, um, it's very probably very small to see, but um, it's slash explore, slash tag, slash IOT. Um, and then in here, we have reports um, that people have created uh, that they've tagged as IOP, um, IOT. There should be some in here, this gets updated all the time, that are DVRs. So this is, um, this is another way you can do searches, is the product of um, Dahua. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but they make DVRs or whatever. So if you're looking for their product, um, you could search for that and then you can get the IP addresses and the information, where they're located and all of that good stuff. Is that feedback just killing everybody? Do I need to switch to handheld? So more recently in March of this year, there was the Vault 7 uh, WikiLeaks release detailing how the CIA performs electronic sur surveillance and cyber warfare, right? So in these documents, it was made ever more obvious that Telnet is on, by default, on Cisco switches. Over 300 different models. 
So by sending a malformed CMP, cluster management protocol, arbitrary code, um, basically you can obtain full control of their machines. Cisco's response was simply to turn off Telnet. So I did a show dance search, and I searched for Cisco with port 23, which is our Telnet port instead of our SSH port, and I got 31,000 results. Um, oddly, quite a few of them in um, Chile. Um, so just in general, when I search for um, port 23, I get over 3 million results. So it's not just Cisco, right? Um, Telnet's not a good protocol to have open uh, on any device. Um, so seriously, just um, turn SSH on uh, and shut port 23 and shut off Telnet. So in the talks that I've seen, um, John Madderly explains that the original intent was for market research. The idea was that a hardware... I'm going to put this on the... I think it's the antenna. Maybe I am. Right. Okay, so the idea was that hardware manufacturers like Cisco or uh, HP would want to see how many devices that they had available on the internet and the basic configuration of those uh, devices that were exposed. Um, the idea being that like they could you know have vanity metrics of how much they have out on the internet or I think that the idea that I think that they should have is they could actually tell their users hey listen you have port 23 open you have telnet on and we can actually telnet onto that box uh, I would like to see the manufacturers go proactive and use this information Um, Shodan also grabs an image uh, from the device in the cases that warrant it. Um, this could be a bad idea, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, YOLO click this and we'll see what happens. I say click, but I got to do this dance where I switch my displays and, you know. So here we have a bunch of devices out there on the internet and Shodan has done what um, internet queries do. They go run a git, the git returns, and you do whatever you want with the data. So the query here is simply HTTP. So what if we search instead for Windows? I think it's because my talk that this doesn't do this anymore. The first time I did this in a talk or whatever, what you would see was mostly webcams that were pointed at Windows. So, the real search that we want to do is remote desktop. And here we have a bunch of Windows remote desktops that are available out on the internet. Oh, the, it's an offense to continue without proper authorization. Okay. You, oh, you can see what... That makes it easy. You can see which... Which users you can try. Why not? Okay, so limitations of the free version. Uh, no more than five pages deep on any of the searches. 
So there's pagination. Um, when I was doing those searches, it shows you about 10 or 20 or whatever, and then you go to page two. You go, uh, once you get to page five, you can't go any deeper than that. You either have to have a better search or you gotta pay for it, right? Uh, you also have no maps uh, when you do the free version. So as an individual, you can get full lifetime access, as I understand it, for $49. Um, you can also, um, but you're limited on the amount of API calls that you can do, so you have to buy up credits on that. Uh, enterprise access would allow you to download or um, stream or have like a monthly hard drive delivered of the data to your company. This would also mean unlimited API, API access to your organization. And Shodan's marketing material boasts that they're already at 56 of the Fortune 100 companies and 1,000 universities. So the real question you have is like, is my device on Shodan? Um, only if your device is directly connected to the internet. Possibly your router uh, may show up depending on the settings at many of the different levels of networking that you have. But even then, depending on how your internet service provider um, is set up, you may or may not be exposed or easily findable. Um, this is the current way things work. As you know, we've got IPv4, we use these routers, we have an internal uh, LAN type of thing. With IPv6, unlimited-ish, like a way bigger number of IP addresses, a lot of things are going to be uh, going direct connect or um, the, the game's gonna change as technology gets better. If you would like to check to see if you're on Shodan, uh, there's a website to do this. I ran this on my computer, right? Good news, you're not on the public Shodan. I'm sure these people are honest and great, awesome people uh, running a great service, the iotscanner.bullguard.com slash search. However, personally, personal decision for you, I d n n um, decided not to do the deep scan and invite someone into my uh, internal network. That's your decision if you want to do that. But you can do a, a, a basic check. There's also a browser plugin that allows you to check the public configuration of the site that you've navigated to. Uh, from the website of the conference that I first gave this at, they were exposed by many ports. It was very uh, curious. I asked them about that. You wonderful people here in, um, in Des Moines, I went to SecDSM. The ports that are open are 80, 443, and 123. Um, what's interesting is the country's Germany and uh, organization's Leaseweb, I don't know. Leaseweb, Deutschland. Uh, awesome work. If someone was looking for something in Iowa, they wouldn't go look here. That's really smart. Um, <laughs> I always like exposing things like in the middle of the talk. You know, people are like, oh, shh. Um, bad words. Um, reference. Uh, John, uh, John Matherly is a way better uh, speaker than me, and he created the tool, so he knows way more about this. So go watch his talks, right? Um, my favorite part in one of these talks is when he goes into how they found that there was a control system for something important. I don't know, a power plant? Uh, and, and it had a UI, it was some place in Europe, uh, uh, specifics aren't important, right? And they contacted them and earnestly trying to alert them. However, if you think we're bad with enterprise security or web security, the response they got back was something to the effect of, it's okay, we have it on a static IP address and no DNS, so we can't be found. <laughs> So um, if you work in industrial control systems, or if, or if you don't, there is a great opportunity to up the, uh, the level of security that there are across, um, across the world on that. Um, there's a book you can uh, pick up by John Matherly, The Complete Guide to Shodan. The suggested price is $4.99. Uh, the minimum price you can pay is $0.99. Cents, or if you're like me, I just paid the maximum 10 bucks because it's a really cool tool. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's awesome. So, I have to get real with you. I've been incredibly uh, tempted to click on the stuff that I'm searching for and the addresses because it's there. 
in the tool. You can drill down, you can click on it, you can go to it in your browser. Um, but I want you to use uh, this information for positive purposes. Uh, accessing or attempting to access uh, someone else's device definitely can be punishable by law. And I tell you these things so that you can protect your own assets, not so that you can go after other people's assets. Because, let's be honest, uh, you may think you're opening a connection to some dummy that allowed their device to be just open on the internet, right? However, it could be that it's someone that's a lot smarter than you that has a honeypot just waiting for you to connect. So in the book, there's a really good explanation of how to detect honeypots using a honey score, which is built into Shodan and built into the API. Um, there's also a really good section on serial uniqueness. Um, really what I'm saying is you probably should go buy the book uh, as a companion to the tool if you're going to dig into it. Um, my name, uh, I said at the beginning, is Aaron Blythe. Uh, you can find out about me on AaronBlythe.org. Uh, you can connect with me. I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, all those things. Uh, I love meeting more people. I'm just getting into security. Like I said, I started off in um, development. Um, I did that consulting for free for some of my friends uh, I told you about. Uh, but now that I've given a talk on Shodan, um, I no longer consult for free. Uh, I charge one beer for each time that I've given this talk. Um, and so now I'm up to three. So if you wanted to sit and talk about Shodan or something sometime, it only cost you three beers and we'll, uh, we'll sit and we'll have a great conversation. So thank you for your time. Uh, rock on.